Welcome to the Racial Justice Teachout on Voter Rights and Voter Suppression. My name is Claire Cisco King. My pronouns are she, her, hers. I'm an associate professor in communication studies and cinema media arts at Vanderbilt University. And I had the honor of moderating this conversation on voter rights and voter suppression. Let me first extend thanks to Millions of Conversations and the Grand Challenge Initiative on Racial Justice and the Third Reconstruction for sponsoring the event and to Professor Adam Meyer for organizing the panel. And of course, I have much thanks to extend to the panelists, Professor Sophie Bjork-James, Charlene Oliver, and Senator Jeff Yarbrough. This conversation on voter rights and voter suppression is one of many teach outs Vanderbilt has hosted with Millions of Conversations, which is a Nashville-based nonprofit aimed at promoting a peaceful society by prioritizing truth and reconciliation. These teach outs focus on matters of racial justice and have addressed such subjects as American identity and the war on terror and critical race theory in Tennessee. This conversation brings together an academic, a community activist and an elected official to discuss a wide range of issues from the impact of white supremacy on voting to gerrymandering and its effects on minority communities. In the following recording, you will get to hear all three panelists speak followed by a brief question and answer period. Now on to introductions. Sophie Bjork James is assistant professor of anthropology at Vanderbilt University. Her research focuses on race and racism, evangelicalism, reproductive politics, white nationalism and hate crimes. Professor Bjork James has engaged in long-term research on both the US based religious right and the white nationalist movement. Her work has appeared on the NBC Nightly News, NPR's All Things Considered, BBC Radio 4's Today, and in the New York Times. She is co-editor of Beyond Populism, Angry Politics, and the Twilight of Neoliberalism, and is the author of The Divine Institution, White Evangelicalism's Politics of the Family, which provides an ethnographic account of how a theology of the family came to dominate a white evangelical tradition in the post-civil rights movement, United States. Professor Bjork James is currently developing two new projects. One explores anti-racist strategies challenging the white nationalist movement in the Northwestern US, and the other explores contemporary pro-life activism and the intersection of abortion politics and environmental politics. Charlene Oliver, our second panelist, is co-founder and co-executive director of the Equity Alliance, a nonprofit that works to build independent political power among the black electorate and to end voter suppression in a state, Tennessee, with one of the lowest voter participation rates in the nation. Oliver is an award-winning community organizer, respected movement builder, and public relations strategist, whose work has been featured in the New York Times, the Washington Post, Rolling Stone, National Journal, just to name a few, and has also appeared on NPR Weekend Edition, MSNBC, and CNN. She is a partner with OEM Consulting Group and a founder of the Power of 10 PAC, a political action committee dedicated to funding and supporting candidates of color. As a consultant and public relations expert for candidates, nonprofits, and small businesses, Oliver has helped to elect school board members, city council members, judges, and state legislators. Finally, Democratic Senator Jeff Yarbrough represents District 21 in the Tennessee State Senate and is the minority leader. Senator Yarbrough has an undergraduate degree from Harvard University and a law degree from University of Virginia, where he served as editor in chief of the Virginia Law Review. He began practicing law at Bass, Berry and Sims in Nashville, where he helped establish the firm's formal pro bono program and earn recognition by the bar for his work defending an inmate facing the death penalty. Generally, Senator Yarbrough's law practice is focused on complex civil, securities, and class action litigation, and the representation of clients in connection with governmental investigations and regulatory proceedings. Before becoming an elected official himself, Senator Yarbrough worked on a number of high profile political campaigns, including Al Gore's presidential campaign and Harold Ford Jr.'s run for the US Senate. He also clerked for Judge Gilbert Merritt of the US Court of Appeals for the Sixth Circuit. We are lucky to have each of these panelists speak to us about voter rights and voter suppression, and I hope you enjoy the conversation. Thank you. Um, we've seen over the last five years a really unprecedented expansion of these 
um, of, of far, far right white nationalist ideas into the broader conservative mainstream. And so that's the new, the, the new theme um, that I'm going to be talking about is about um, the kind of questioning democracy itself and decreasing support for democracy. Um, the very old theme that, that we can see in today's environment is the limitation of voting rights. Um, so I'm going to start with what is old. So limitations of voting rights have, you know, been inscribed in U.S. democracy since it, its founding, right? That on the one hand, uh, the U.S. was founded as a democracy, but this was limited to protect um, privi the privileged, right? In terms of, we all know that, you know, it was white male property owners who were first given the right to vote. And every expansion of, of that right has been um, won by social movements. Um, demanding demanding change, and then by uh, the federal government protecting those rights. Um, so despite the 15th Amendment ratified in 1870, which prohibited states from denying at least male citizens the right to vote based on race or color, um, particularly in the South, a wide array of restrictions on voting rights um, were in place um, up through the civil rights movement of the 1960s, drastically limiting um, the rights to vote for African Americans in particular. Um, so um, this is why voting rights were central to the civil rights struggle. So even after the passage of the 1960s oh, yeah. um, Civil Rights Act, which guaranteed the right to vote, widespread white opposition in the South um, kept many African Americans from being able to either register to vote or vote in practice. So it wasn't until the infamous Montgomery to Selma march um, that was met with um, violence, um, known as Bloody Sunday, that the Voting Rights Act um, received enough support um, to pass uh, in 1965. Um, and that was a, a guaranteed voter protection, um, regardless of race. Um, so I, I want to go back and start this conversation there. And and to propose that we think of democracy as a contest, that there's it's always potentially limited and that US democracy has largely been defined by people in power uh, working to limit who can participate and maintain that power uh, alongside um, justice movements, um, historically, um, you know, movements for either um, gender equality or racial equality, um, fighting to guarantee that right, right? But that, that that right has always been met by opposition by white supremacists who've, been, who've used various forms of political power to limit um, the machinations of democracy um, towards uh, to, towards those um, those already in power. Um, so today we are experiencing um, a new um, like a, a new new form of limitations on voting. So ever since um, 2013, when the Supreme Court um, decided in Shelby County versus Holder um, to gut this Voting Rights Act, um, claiming it was outdated and no longer needed, um, there's been in the last nine years um, a significant increase in um, voting uh, suppression of um, of voting and limitations on, on voting rights, but um, this has become accelerated uh, in the last um, year or two. Um, so the Brennan Center for Justice um, published a report um, just last month um, that tracked that over 250 bills across the US um, focused on restrictive provisions around voting. Uh, and this is you know, a really um, challenging, um, challenging, um, moment um, in terms of restrictions on voting, right? And it's kind of continuing this tradition of attempting to limit access to voting um, to protect those in power. Um, but the thing that's new that I, I think is important for us also um, to be considering is that um, there's in um, the conservative movement and especially among the, the Republican party um, has experienced a broadening um, kind of like basically giving up on democracy, um, of questioning the very foundations of democracy in terms of as a legitimate um, form of governance, um, right? So there's, this poll came out in um, National Poll in 2020 um, that Larry Bartels, a political scientist, um, found that over 40% of Republican respondents um, in this national poll um, expressed um, an agreement with the statement that, um, a time will come when patriotic Americans um, have to 
um, take their take the law into their own hands. Um, also saying that uh, what, what he calls ethnic antagonism is leading many Republicans to view authoritarianism and even violence as acceptable. So this poll came out before, um, like in, in, you know, in 2020, um, but uh, over, and half, over half of the respondents agreed that, quote, the traditional American way of life is disappearing so fast we may have to use force um, to save it. Um, and another, so we're in showing that um, the, the strongest predictor by far of these anti-democratic attitudes um, is, is ethnic antagonism, um, especially concerns about the political power and claims on government for resources of immigrants, African-Americans and Latinos. Um, so there's already this kind of racial, what he calls ethnic antagonism, what we could call racism um, or concerns about racial, um, racial um, changes in racial power that are leading to a decrease in support of democracy. Um, and of course, the 2020 election only exacerbated this. Um, so a poll that came, um, came out uh, earlier this year that found that um, over 71% of Republicans um, saw Joe Biden's victory as illegitimate, um, largely uh, and largely defended um, the storming of the Capitol. Um, last year in attempts to um, disrupt the, the election, right? I mean, it's commonly said that democracy really relies on the consent of the loser, that even, you know, that there's, there has to be an acceptance that the system is fair uh, and that the winner won through legitimate means, even if you disagree with the um, the like political stances um, of the victor. And I think with uh, the erosion of that, we're seeing really tricky times ahead because, uh, you know, a democracy really relies on kind of, yeah, consent that the process is legitimate and that, you know, democratic values are important in that, you know, uh, democracy is the, is the, should be the arena um, for us to kind of battle out our political ideas. So if no, it's no longer democracy that that's, that's, that becomes that arena, then other forms of options um, seem legitimate, um, including authoritarianism, including violence. And we're seeing increasing support for these ideas amongst a broader conservative movement, um, which is deeply troubling for me as a scholar of um, the far right white nationalist movement to see um, kind of their, their beliefs and commitment to destabilizing, democ destabilizing democracy really expand. Um, and I'm gonna end with um, pointing out to one broader, uh, broader issue that I think is really um, kind of undergirding a, a, lot of, a lot of this and that's uh, demographic change. Um, so, uh, and particularly uh, articles like this, which use uh, dem um, demographic change to um, and um, specific language that make it seem like as um, because white Americans are going to be losing their majority status, uh, it using um, words like lose um, uh, can like imply and majority status can imply um, a loss of power. Um, and that can trigger um, insecurity and fear amongst particularly white conservative Americans um, about what that, what that means. Um, and that I think we can kind of see in a lot of the racial politics today, um, but also the politics around uh, both challenging democracy and limiting access to democ democracy, um, a fear of this demographic change in that within the next 20 years, um, the, the white, white Americans will no longer be the majority. Uh, and that's provoking a lot of um, fear, particularly amongst conservative, um, conservative, um, conservative whites about what that, what the future looks like. Um, and this is, a, this is even true for, uh, or particularly true for white Christians in that uh, Robert P. Jones has shown that we've gone from 54% um, white Christian in, um, demographics in the United States um, during Obama to 44% um, of um, demographic of white Christians um, in the United States um, in the last couple of years. Um, so it's a drop of about 1% um, per year. Um, and that with that, 
um, changing, let me stop sharing my screen, with that um, change in um, demographics can inspire kind of more um, insecurity and more attempts to kind of to question democracy itself. Um, so I'm going to end there um, and let my, um, my colleagues uh, talk more about the local situation, and I'm happy to answer questions in the Q&A. So next up, we have Charlene Oliver from the Equity Alliance. All right, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for having me. Um, thanks to uh, Millions of Conversations and Vanderbilt University for inviting me to speak. Um, you know, I wanna just uh, echo a lot of what um, Dr. Um, James has mentioned how this conversation around voting rights and what's happening in Tennessee, um, it can't be ignored the racial component of this. I think that is what undergirds a lot of what is driving the anti-democratic um, movement to dismantle democracy. And so as the Equity Alliance, we have found ourselves in this position of not only fighting for um, democracy and what that means, but also we advocate for um, Black Tennesseans. And so what happens is our voting rights tend to be at um, under attack the most. <laughs> so um, I just can't ignore the fact that historically, you know, Black people um, in this country have essentially gotten our citizenship through constitutional amendment. And so that can't be ignored how ever since we have been uh, citizens in this country, our existence has been politicized, whether that's through the US census and how we were counted as three fifths of a human for um, political power in the South, in the deep South. So dating back all the way to that, uh, this conversation has always been about uh, the white power structure being in opposition to black establishment and, and power in this country. So the voting rights fight has always been at the center of the racial conversation. Um, anytime in this country that, you know, essentially black Americans have tried to exert our self agency because we have been under community control since um, chattel slavery. Anytime we have exerted that um, power or uh, showed any sort of progress made in America, you will always see a backlash. Um, and mostly of the most violent kind, um, dating back all the way to Reconstruction when um, Black folks were emancipated and. Um, you saw immediately after that, right after um, 1865, the reconstruction era of our first black senators and uh, black people were winning and, and being elected across the country, not only just in the US Senate, but in Congress and in local state houses. And so that made a lot of folks anxious um, that this anxiety and fear that drives um, the white power structure. And so that is what bore the birth, the, the Ku Klux Klan. And so right after that, when you had um, the federal troops come out of the South um, to protect the, uh, the black population, and during reconstruction, that is when you see the shift of no longer the 40 acres and a mule and um, the voting, the voter registration rolls dropped to 3% uh, right after uh, reconstruction because of white terrorism uh, attacking black folks. So you always, you always see dating back from that, this uh, backlash. And then if you fast forward to today, that is being reincarnated through um, the movement on the far right, uh, almost overtaking and usurping the, the conservative Republican Party. What we see as the Republican Party today is probably not what um, conservatives would describe them as. So that's why you see folks like um, Governor Haslam no, you know, not supporting what's happening in the state. But, um, and so insert the Equity Alliance, we came on the scene uh, in November of 2016, right at the, the rise of this type of political um, climate. And for no, you know, obviously we were uh, 
uh, we were angry about what, what was happening. If you look at what was happening in the country at the time, the Black Lives Matter movement was uh, alive and well, and that impacted us as well. And then you had Donald Trump being elected as sort of this last straw of uh, we got to do something, right? So ever since then, uh, the reason why we champion and fight for voting rights so much is because um, we know that all of the rights that we have gained has always had to come through landmark legislation. And any issue that we talk about in America that impacts us, at the crux of that is voting rights. The foundation of that is you cannot change any policy or issue. I don't care if it's climate justice, reproductive rights, uh, housing, affordable housing. If you can't vote, if you can't have that say so, um, we don't, we don't have a say, we don't have power as people. So we as the Equity Alliance exist to shift that power back into the hands of the people. But what you have um, going on is this sort of push pull uh, going on where um, the right is trying to insulate and concentrate power to only a few people. Um, whether that is the governor of Tennessee or the state legislature. So we have some of the least uh, amount of elected offices, uh, constitutional offices across the state because that power has been given to the state legislature or to the governor in, or the Supreme Court to appoint some of our constitutional officers. So, um, and you also see this stripping away of rights for allowing people to have a say so in democracy, whether that is um, the, the, as, the, as recent as the school board elections being partisan. Um, you see, uh, you know, all of obviously the voter suppression that exists in this state that has existed ever since um, the Obama era. So Obama being elected was another catalyst to all of this different demographic shift of anxiety. So um, ever since 2009, when our current Secretary of State, uh, Trey Hargett has been in office, you have seen a decline in voter registrations. Um, and you have also seen a uh, systematic, um, I'm trying to find the right word, a systematic uh, carving out of rights for, for um, uh, people of color, black folks, um, college students, uh, disabled and elderly people, um, low income folks across the state. So uh, there are many, many laws on the books right now that is designed to make sure that we do not have political power and we don't have a say so in our process and in our elections. Um, so what the Equity Alliance has had to do is a lot of times play defense. Um, unfortunately, we have had to stand up against these attacks on voting rights over the past five years. And we have been ta targeted and attacked personally um, as an organization uh, back in 2018. During the 2018 midterms, when well, you had a hotly contested race of US Senate uh, candidate, now candidate Marsha Blackburn running against uh, Governor Bredesen, Phil Bredesen. It was slated to be one of the top four Senate races in the country to watch. So a lot of people was paying attention and this was the first election right after Donald Trump is elected. So mm -hmm. attentions are running high on both sides of the argument, on both sides of the aisle. So you had an organization like ours that was um, tasked with running the Tennessee Black Voter Project. We coalitioned about 25 different organizations, large and small, incorporated and unincorporated to register 55,000 black and brown people across the state. And so what we were doing was turning in voter registration forms um, in different election, uh, at different county collect election commissions. Um, but we ran into a lot of issues in Shelby County. And it's not a coincidence that Shelby County is the largest, uh, has the largest amount of black folks. It's about 60, 68% black but the election administrator is white, Linda, Phil Linda Phillips. She did not want to process our voter registration forms. So there was a lot of um, obstruction to wanting to process um, forms that just so happened to have names that appeared to be black. So what we had to do was unfortunately sue Linda Phillips in um, court to get her to process those forms, but it didn't stop there. We eventually won that case. Uh, we uh, were targeted after this because we did not only register 55,000 folks, we actually submitted uh, upwards of 91,000 forms across the state in three months during that election. 
And uh, word got around to our Secretary of State that this was happening. And oh boy, how dare those Black folks think they can register to vote. So <laughs> six months later, um, there was a caption bill filed. It was tried to be done slickly. Uh, <laughs> under the radar, but we got word about it that this bill was being proposed in the legislative cycle in 2019 that would now criminalize uh, groups for doing large scale voter registration and Senator Yarbrough knows all about this <laughs> happening. Um, and so they have retaliated against us essentially uh, for trying to register black and brown folks um, to be uh, having political power. And uh, we had to fight that bill off. What would have happened is uh, being criminalized for some making mistakes on a form, uh, unintentionally or intentionally. And uh, we would have been fined up to $10,000 uh, or put in jail for up to a year, which means we would have been uh, placed with a felony on our record. And when, a felon, when you get a felony in Tennessee, that means you lose your voting rights. So by design, it was meant to cause fear. It was meant to stifle our efforts and intimidate us. But we didn't stop there. We ended up trying to fight this bill off in a legislative session, but they passed the bill anyway. It ended up being unconstitutional. We filed a federal lawsuit. Six months later, the federal judge um, ruled, on an, ruled on an injunction where um, that law was ended up being repealed. So we had to fight that um, uh, in 2019 and then fast forward to uh, 2020 when you have a global pandemic affecting people all across the country and it's a major major election pr presidential election year and um, folks want to stay in their house but they need to be able to vote so we ended up having to sue the state again so that every Tennessean could um, vote with an absentee ballot from their home safely um, from the pandemic and so they challenged that and they obstructed and fought that off but we were able to again and get a, an injunction to be victorious so that folks could submit an absentee ballot in 2020. Um, and here we are again now in 2022, um, seeing our rights and our representation attacks, attacks through gerrymandering. Um, the state legislature called themselves having a uh, transparent process um, but it was not because they held the maps that they wanted to propose close to their chest and um, they waited until the day of the committee hearing to release them. So no one got to look at these maps beforehand to have any input, to have any sort of um, say on how they, those could be changed, despite the fact that the Equity Alliance was one of um, four groups across the state that submitted alternative maps that showed that there could be fair representation without having to split up counties. But they did it anyway. And um, Nashville was in their crosshairs. And so they ended up deciding to split Nashville into three congressional districts. and. Um, I go back to the racial part because this is not by design that, um, uh, you know, that race plays a part in, into the gerrymandering because the, the way that the lines were split, they were split right along um, black neighborhoods. So the attack was on black voter representation in a democratic county. And so uh, the black vote, uh, black representation was split from 28% down to three different ways, 8%, 15%, and I believe it was 12%. So I live in the district that is in 14% political power. And that is in no way uh, a represent, representative of where I live. And now we are all sharing political representation with rural counties and um, rural uh, congr Congress people ha who have, that have no interest in uh, what happens in Nashville and assuring that Nashville has representation. So here we are, we find ourselves always challenging the backlash. Um, that is always uh, along racial lines. So that is the work that we do sometimes, but it's just not in the voter, voter space. 
Uh, it's just that voting rights is the most important and most effective tool that we have to fight back. And so we find ourselves having to fight in that space a lot, but we stand up for black folks and wherever we see injustice, whether that is um, on the education front, whether that is in the housing space, whether it's putting making sure equitable development is happening in Nashville, um, we stand up for the rights and we stand up against white supremacy in all of its forms, whether it's the voting, uh, voter suppression, school to prison pipeline, uh, felony disenfranchisement. So we are here to make sure that Black folks have political power and economic power in Tennessee. Thank you, Charlene. Uh, and now we have Jeffrey Yarbrough, Senator from District 21. Uh, thanks so much, Claire, and um, it's a, an honor. I want to thank uh, millions of conversations in Vanderbilt University, as well as my fellow panelists here. Uh, you know, when you start thinking about, uh, you know, the impact of historical white power structures on voting in Tennessee, I'm, I'm reminded of a story that um, I think it comes from David Foster Wallace, where, you know, uh, two fish are swimming through the through the ocean they run into an older fish who asks how's the water today and they say fine and go their own way and then one of the young fish looks to the other and says what the hell is water um the way that uh the history of everything from slavery to jim crow and the failures of reconstruction has shaped tennessee is so pervasive that it really can't, it almost can't be separated out from just what day-to-day -day reality is. We think about where the, the largest communities of, uh, largest African-American communities in Tennessee right now are largely where Union troops were located in April of 1865, right? I mean, you can look at where uh, camps were at that moment in time and see where the Black community has l largely grown in Tennessee's history. The Constitution that we have in Tennessee was passed in 1870, sort of as a, a blueprint for how Southern states could uh, get out of, could get, do what was called redemption during Reconstruction and reestablish those power structures. Uh, and so it is truly uh, one of those things that it, 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 it's all surrounding in a lot of ways. Uh, and Charlene talked a little bit about sort of some of the fights that we have had in the, in the legislature in recent years. And I think this is actually one of the most important and most concerning fights that we have. Because it is clear at this point in time that the two parties are fighting about whether or not we're going to have an inclusive democracy. Uh, we like to think of ourselves as the oldest democracy in the world, but we really have only started the experiment in having a genuine multi ethnic democracy in 1965. Right? Like that, the, that part of the national experiment is actually still young and I think still quite fragile as recent years have borne out. But we went from a place where in the early 2000s, the Voting Rights Act was reauthorized by a bipartisan majority in both houses of Congress with, I don't, I'm not sure if there was a single no vote against it, but now is a bright line uh, wedge issue between the two parties. Uh, you've got a United States Supreme Court where the conservative members and one of the biggest pivot points between the conservative members and the liberal members, you know, surrounds these uh, issues of democracy, uh, where you had John Roberts writing the uh, the bill that originally gutted the, the case that originally gutted the Voting Rights Act, basically saying, well, we've come so far since then, so we can't rely on the findings that were made then to justify the Voting Rights Act. And, you know, and then just a few years later, in this past year, we had the even more conservative members of the Supreme Court uh, have, have basically said the Voting Rights Act is effectively dead. In uh, for 
or at least can't be used quickly to deal with some of the gerrymandering issues. And so when we do think about where this is, there's no question that Charlene is exactly right when she talks about the way that the gerrymandering worked in Tennessee this year. Uh, if you look in middle Tennessee, there are uh, you know, really four communities that are where you have uh, a large concentration of African-American voters. And it'll be in Southeast Davidson County in Nashville, North Nashville, East Nashville, and then the Northwest part of Rutherford County. And in the four, and it, all four of those communities have been split into four different congressional districts. And that is uh, sort of, I, I mean, the best that one could say is that it is not the intent of the attack uh, because they're trying to dismantle uh, not just minority power, but democratic power as well. But there's no question that the means that are being used are uh, the division of minority communities when it comes to our, uh, the drawing of district lines, as well as some of the most aggressive uh, voter, voter laws in the country. So uh, Tennessee is a place that's changed a lot on this. So in uh, earlier this year, an academic, I believe in Illinois, did a issued a review of the where they basically rank all how hard it is to vote in various places. And they also have they compare all the states uh, from 1996 through 2016 and now 2020. And in 1996, Tennessee was one of the top 10 places in terms of ease of voting. And since the takeover of the, of the Republican Party in Tennessee, that's, we've gone from being one of the top 10 easiest places to vote to one of the top three hardest places to vote. And during that same time, we went from being a rant, you know, sort of in the top portion, at least of Southern states in terms of participation and turnout to being a, a damn near the bottom of the entire country when it comes to turnout. There are some years where we are absolutely last when it comes to voter turnout. And then other years when we overachieve and get up to about 47th. But that is, uh, is, is a real threat right now. And then to connect it back to, uh, I mean, I think this is the issue of our time. Uh, and I, I think it, to connect it back to uh, the PowerPoint presentation at the beginning, I think that the, when you, when the, cause I, I think the slide, I think said something to the effect of, you know, uh, white, white to lose, whites to lose majority status, right? And this notion of a uh, fear that's out there, I think, is is very is very important, and and I think that one of the things that we don't always think about in political conversations is there's different ways to feel power, and the cultural the culture of the country is frankly moving further faster and further than the politics of the country, right, and so as much as I get beat up in the Tennessee legislature every day, I know that when I walk outside of those doors, that the world that I'm actually living in is not represented by the General Assembly and the votes that it's taking. But that, that, but that because the power, the power of, the, of the culture is actually moving much more aggressively towards a place of recognizing the value and dignity of all people, recognizing their contribution and, and moving in that direction. And so I think there, there's different ways that people feel power. And as much as we feel the, the, uh, those of a, people on the left might feel the, the political power being used aggressively, I think we have to recognize that there is, that, that, that that there's a segment of our of the of the white community that, that does that feels in a similar way that they are losing their power every day in that cultural sense, and I think it's provoking a really fierce response right now that that needs to be taken seriously.
Um, thank you to all three panelists. Uh, we have some opportunity now for, for Q&A and discussion. Um, and, and we've got some questions that have come through in the chat. But before I turn to those, I just want to see if, if any of the panelists wanted to, to respond to anything or, or, or sort of speak among each other. Okay, so one of the, the questions that, that, uh, that I saw come through in the chat, it was directed at Charlene, um, but, I, but I think probably all three panelists could, could speak to, to different ways to answer this question. But the, the question came from, came from the folks at, at Millions of Conversation who gathered us here, um, which is asking what are some of the ways that, that people, folks in their communities can organize um, sort of you know, from where they are with their established networks or to, to create new networks um, to, to organize organize against these ongoing attempts to restrict voting rights? Yeah, um, I think we have to recognize that everyone, uh, I, I have a love-hate relationship with this word activist because <laughs> uh, I'm much more than that. Um, and there's a connotation with that as well. And I don't like to fall into that stereotype, but when you think about the root word of act, um, I think everyone, is an activist and I'm here to make sure that everyone gets to participate. And um, we all have a duty to act. We all have a duty to do something. And a lot of times this, this political space can feel so um, toxic that I, people wanna just step away and be like, okay, I, I can't, I don't do politics. And I hate that word, that phrase as well, because um, to say I don't do politics means you're allowing someone to speak for you. Um, it's almost like, you know, are you gonna let somebody walk in your house, eat your groceries in your, in your refrigerator and pay your bills? And, or, you know what I'm saying? It's, it's almost like that. So are you okay with someone just uh, speaking for you? So we all have a duty to do things and, and we can't let this feel intimidating because there are, small acts that lead to big wins. And um, there are things that make a big difference. When I worked in Congressman Jim Cooper's office uh, for about two years, you know, I saw how making phone calls can make a difference because it can sway a, a congressman to vote one way or the other. Public pressure is important. So don't discount the ability to pick up the phone and call your state senator or your state representative or go up to the Capitol and meet them and meet with them. They work for us and they have an, an obligation to make space for us to have our voice heard. So don't discount small acts like that. When you see things on the Internet that says, call your representative, call your legislator, do that, like uh, send an email, because if five of us in the email and then 20 of us and then 100 of us, it's going to start, they're going to start paying attention. Um, so things like that, even as uh, small as like volunteering for organizations like ours who where we need door knockers, we need people who can make calls to folks in districts to say, hey, are you registered to vote? Do you have a plan? Um, that little act as well makes a big difference because a lot of folks just want to be engaged. They want to feel like they're included um, and they got they got their door knocked. Um, so we want to make sure that we're not pushing people out to the margins but bringing them in. Um, don't discount the fact of hosting things at your house, whether it's uh, small gatherings to uh, support a candidate of your choice. You know, So there are small things that we can do and this is all organizing. Um, don't discount political giving. Just like we give to charities, political giving is just as important. We have to give to candidates who are going to stand up uh, for values that we believe in. Uh, and so those are some things that we're, we're encouraging as civic action. Um, in this moment in 2022, uh, the Equity Alliance is looking to put out our Tennessee Voter Guide um, that will come out April 8th. We will do that for every election this year. Um, and so look out, be on the lookout for that at tnvoterguides.com. And we ask for volunteers to help us put that guide together. So if you have skill sets and uh, expertise in a certain area, if you're a lawyer and you want to donate your time, we need poll watchers. We need people filing, filing lawsuits and pro bono lawsuits on our behalf. Those are things that can be um, done as well um, as we as we look to the, the, the 2022 elections in August and November. 
we have to make sure we're encouraging the people in our circle uh, because we take advantage of the fact that we think that our cousins and our aunts and our grandma is actually voting, but grandma, cousin, and uncle think you're voting <laughs> and, they, and they're just leaving it to you. So, uh, and so nobody's talking about it and we need to make sure we're pinging everyone to say, hey, are you registered? Did you know that there's an election? So do that work as well. So there's all kinds of ways that you can plug in. I'll, I'll echo uh, most of what Charlene just said. I, and I sort of put this in a few categories. And I think the first thing is don't be a spectator. It's called self-government for a reason. And I think right now everything's become very nationalized. And uh, we, we think of politics as something that where we sit at home and watch it on TV. Um, we root for the red team or blue team instead of actually being part of it and being active in it. And so when people tell me they vote all the time, a lot of times they just mean presidential elections. And if you just vote in a presidential election, you basically don't vote for anyone who actually day-to-day -day exercises real power over the things in your community and that will affect your life. Uh, so we got to, I mean, I think being active across the local state legislative and into the federal is all important. I think the second piece that I always like to say here is I think people can get overwhelmed by it. Um, is it look, and I, this goes for me, okay? I have a conversation like, how, how do you fix all of these things? And, but you know what? It's not anybody's job is not to fix all of it, but all of us can do something to contribute to um, a better political future and a better future for our community. And I, I sort of think there's the baseline, which is that voting and supporting candidates and paying attention to what's happening, but then pick your space. Pick the gifts that you have and where you can find a place to plug in. And whether that's because you're an accountant and a historian, a, a graphic designer or anything else, there's a place for you to find a spot and to contribute in a gigantic way. And then I think the third thing that we've got to do is we've got to build coalitions beyond our French base. We got to go sometimes to where it's not comfortable. Uh, you know, if, if you're not reaching out to people and also giving them the grace to change, right? If we built, you know, the future on only people that were committed to racial progress in this country, we never would have had racial progress in this country, right? We always have to be building a bigger group and trying to bring people along and finding uh, how to, how to, how to build that, that group in a larger way. And I think that sometimes that is a, a challenge for us because look, I'm a democratic state Senator and don't ever have to leave Davidson County to talk to my voters. But it's really important for me to go out to you know, Decatur County, Tennessee and Wayne County, Tennessee and other places because if we're not building bridges elsewhere in the state, we're not gonna be able to move forward. Um, yeah, thanks. Thanks so much. Um, there's, there's, I feel like I, you know, when it's interesting, because when I give talks and say, you know, participate in democracy, like, that's the best way also to counter the white nationalist movement, because they're trying to limit who can participate, you know, counter how to counter organized racism is to defend democracy and make sure democracy is available to everybody. And it's interesting, because, you know, you talk, I talk to young people and I talk about democracy and their eyes kind of glaze over <laughs> um, because I think there is, especially amongst young, young, many young folks, a kind of disconnect or a belief that, you know, participating in democracy doesn't really matter. So I think the more we can kind of encourage, encourage that, the better. Um, and I also think like one, you know, it's, this is a, a, a goal that's hard to implement, but I think for a lot of, um, a lot of especially conservative white Americans, they only see, they, they only believe it, they, they, their only experience with um, democracy is, is about hierarchy. And so I think there's a, a fear that if um, white people lose demographic power, then they will lose not only 
privilege, but will be subject to the same forms of discrimination that people of color have been subjected to historically. And I feel like for many of us, we can imagine a multiracial democracy based on equality, right? That there isn't, it's not about suddenly having like a new, a new like minority that will be subject to prejudice, right? That there can be, and so I think the more that we can kind of advocate a vision that, you know, equality and democracy is possible and feasible and our future, um, the better. Um, so, so I have a question that I think synthesizes some things that, I, that I've heard each of you say. One is that we have to really understand the the, the long arc of history uh, to understand how what's happening now has connections back to what, what happened um, centuries ago. Um, and that also a lot of what happens around voting rights and, and, and um, attacks on voting rights happens almost invisibly or behind the scenes and, um, and people aren't necessarily aware of those um, of those threats. And, you know, and then on top of that, you, you've got um, questions about, about, you know, politics and elections happening on multiple levels, the local, the state, and, and the federal, which can, can be overwhelming for people to, to process all of this information. Um, so I have just sort of a pragmatic question about what, what you recommend to folks who are, who are trying to get a hold of this bigger picture, um, both in terms of its historical arc, but also the multiple layers across, um, you know, from the local to the federal. Are there, are there places that you would send people to, to start gathering gathering information, sites that you recommend for where people can, can begin to learn and, and do their research and, and try not to feel so overwhelmed by all of this information? Uh, there's, there's all kinds of resources out there um, documenting this, um, but I love uh, Nicole Hannah-Jones, uh, the 1619 Project. Uh, I would start there to really understand the historical context of what is going on today because she connects she connects American society um, back to chattel slavery and every institution in our American society has a connection to chattel slavery and our capitalistic economy and how it's driven off of um, free labor. So uh, you got to understand that context, but also how Black people have been sort of this reliable demographic that has had to make America live up to the ideals that it says it, it, it values but doesn't do it in real reality. And so that's why you see uh, this narrative of black women having to save democracy um, from itself. So I would start with the 1619 Project. If you can't read the, the book, I would start with the podcast. It's got about six episodes on there. That's really, really good. Um, and you can find that on any, any platform. Uh, there's um, How to Be, be an Anti-Racist book uh, by Dr. Kendi, and um, there's all kinds of books. Uh, Carol Anderson with One Person No Vote is another book to, uh, that's good to read, and also uh, The New Jim Crow, and the name, the author is blanking on me, um, but if you sure, like The New Jim Crow, that's a great book as well. So, I mean, I, mean, I think the history examples are there are lots i mean you, you, there are lots of books to read either david halberstam's book the children or john lewis anything about john lewis and you can learn a little bit more about just nashville's history in this movement uh which actually like i think is a is a vital importance if you want to connect at the local level but look i do think it's uh i would also recommend that you find ways to get both national and local news into whatever you're taking in every day. And th that doesn't mean that, that you got to read every paper cover to cover. It certainly doesn't mean that you need to watch like Rachel Maddow every night every of the week for, for, for an hour. Sometimes we need to get away from it. But, but you got to have some avenues that work for you where you can get some trusted voices and some diverse voices. And that, I sort of mean diverse for everybody. Like there, if, you, if you don't know what the other side's not saying, you 
you like you won't know what's actually happening you but try to keep up with with what's happening both at the at the national level which is kind of easy i think but it can be a little bit hard to find local news in almost any place in the country right now and so finding some good local sources there um which usually it, i think it depends on the platform but you know, I mean, frankly, the Tennessee Holler is doing a great job of of, of pulling a, a lot of information together these days in Tennessee. But starting with a lot, any of our, you know, kind of a, more aggressive and smart local reporters and trying to follow some of those people, I think it's really important to, if you follow what's going on in the news, you'll get interested enough in what's going going on in the history that you'll you'll find find some of those uh, some of those sources. I'll just third as all of those. I think those are all fantastic sources. So I think we have reached the one o'clock hour, which brings our conversation to um, a close. Um, so then there's some other stuff coming up in the, um, the chats, including um, information about following millions of conversations uh, where you can continue to get um, information and about including about programming. So thanks to everyone for being here. Thanks uh, to our panelists, Professor Bjork James, uh, Charlene Oliver and Senator uh, Jeff Yarbrough. Thank you to millions of conversations and Vanderbilt's Grand Challenge Initiative on Racial Justice in the Third Reconstruction for having us um, together. And, and thanks for the, the insights and the participation today. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everybody.